In the Field, page 155 through 170. At daybreak, the platoon of eighteen soldiers formed into a loose rank and began tramping side by side through the deep muck of the shipfield. They moved slowly in the rain, leaning forward heads down. They used the butts of their weapons as probes, wading across the field to the river, and then turning and wading back again. They were tired and miserable, and all they wanted now was to get finished. Kiowa was gone. He was under the mud and water, folded in with the war, and their only thought was to find him and dig him out and then move to some place dry and warm. It had been a hard night, maybe the worst ever. The rains had fallen without stop, and the song trombone had overflowed its banks. and the muck had now risen thigh-deep in the field along the river. A low, gray mist hovered over the land. Off to the west there was thunder, soft little moaning sounds, and the monsoons seemed to be last, a lasting element of the war. The eighteen soldiers moved in silence. First, Lieutenant Jimmy Cross went f first, now and then straightening out the rank, closing up the gaps. His uniform was dark with mud. His arms and face were filthy. Early in the morning he had radioed in the MIA report, giving the name and circumstances, but he was now determined to find his man, no matter what, even if it meant flying in slabs of concrete and damming up the river and draining the entire field. He would not lose a member of his command like this. It wasn't right. Kiowa had been a fine soldier and a fine human being, a devout Baptist, and there was no way Lieutenant Cross would allow such a good man to be lost under the slime of a shipfield. Briefly he stopped and watched the clouds. Except for some occasional thunder, it was a deeply quiet morning, just a rain and the steady sloshing sound of eighteen men wading through the thick waters. Lieutenant Cross wished the rain would let up. Even for an hour it would make things easier. But then he shrugged. The rain was the war, and you had to fight it. Turning, he looked out across the field, and yelled at one of his men to close up the rank. Not a man, really, a boy. The young soldier stood off by himself, at the center of the field in knee-deep water, reaching down with both hands, as if chasing some object just beneath the surface. The boy's shoulders were shaking. Jimmy Cross yelled again, but the young soldier did not turn or look up. In his hooded poncho everything caked with mud. The boy's face was impossible to make out. The filth seemed to erase identities, transforming the men into identical copies of a single soldier, which was exactly how Jimmy Cross had been trained to treat them, as interchangeable units of command. It was difficult sometimes, but he tried to avoid that sort of thinking. He had no military ambitions. He preferred to view his men not as units, but as human beings. And Kiowa had been a splendid human being, the very best, intelligent and gentle and quiet-spoken. Very brave, too, and decent. The kid's father taught Sunday school in Oklahoma City, where Kiowa had been raised to believe in the promise of salvation under Jesus Christ. And the conviction had always been present in the boy's smile, in its posture toward the world, in the way he never went anywhere without an illustrated New Testament that his father had mailed to him as a birthday present back in January. A crime, Jimmy Cross thought. Looking out toward the river, he knew for a fact that he made a mistake setting up here. The order had come from higher, true, but still he should have exercised some field discretion. He should have moved to higher ground for the night, should have radioed in false coordinates. There was nothing he could do now but still it was a mistake and a hideous waste. He felt sick about it. Standing in the deep waters of the field, First Lieutenant Jimmy Cross began composing a letter in his head to the kid's father. Not mentioning the ship field, just saying what a fine soldier Kiowa had been, what a fine human being, and how he was the kind of son that any father could be proud of forever. The search went slowly. For a time the morning seemed to brighten, the sky going to a lighter shade of silver, but then the rains came back hard and steady. There was the feel of permanent twilight. At the far left of the line, Azar and Norman Bowker and Mitchell Sanders waded through the edge of the field closest to the river. They were tall men, but at times the muck came to mid-thigh, or other times to the crotch. 
Azar kept shaking his head. He coughed and shook his head and said, Man, talk about irony. I bet if Kaiwa was here, I bet he'd just laugh. Eating shit. It's your classic irony. Fine, said Norman Bowker. Now pipe down. Azar sighed. Wasted in the waste, he said. A shit field. You gotta admit, it's pure world-class irony. The three men moved with slow, heavy steps. It was hard to keep balance. Their boots sank into the ooze, which produced a powerful downward suction. And with each step, they would have to pull up hard to break the hold. The rain made quick dents in the water, like tiny mouths, and the stink was everywhere. When they reached the river, they shifted a few meters to the north and began wading back up the field. Occasionally they used their weapons to test the bottom, but mostly they just searched with their feet. A classic case, case Azar was saying, fighting the dirt, so to speak. That tells the story. Enough, Bowker said. Like those old cowboy movies. One more redskin bites the dirt. I'm serious, man. Zip it shut. Azar smiled and said, Classic. The morning was cold and wet. They had not slept during the night, not even for a few moments, and the three of them were feeling the tension as they moved across the field toward the river. There was nothing they could do for Kiowa. Just find him and slide him aboard a chopper. Whenever a man died, it was always the same. A desire to get it over with, quickly, no frills or ceremony. And what they wanted now was to head for a villa and get under a roof and forget about what happened during the night. Halfway across the field, Mitchell Sanders stopped. He stood for a moment with his eyes shut, feeling along the bottom with a foot. Then he passed his weapon over to Norman Bowker, reached down into the muck. After a second, he hauled up a scummy green rucksack. The three men did not speak for a time. The pack was heavy with mud and water, dead-looking. Inside were a pair of moccasins, an illustrated New Testament. Well, Mitchell Sanders finally said, the guy's around here somewhere. Better tell the LT. Screw him. Yeah, but some LT, Sanders said, camps us in a toilet. Man don't know shit. Nobody knew, Bowker said. Maybe so, maybe not. Ten billion places we could have set up last night, and the man picks a latrine. Norman Bowker stared down at the rucksack. It was now made it was made of a dark green nylon with an aluminum frame, but now it had the curious look of flesh. It wasn't the LT's fault, Bowker said quietly. Whose then? Nobody's. Nobody knew till afterward. Mitchell Sanders made a sound in his throat. He hoisted up the rucksack, slipped into the harness, and pulled the straps tight. All right, but this much for sure. The man knew it was raining. He knew about the river. One plus one, add it up. You get exactly what happened. Sanders glared at the river. Move it, he said. Kai was waiting on us. Slowly then, bending against the rain, Azar and Norman, and Norman Bowker and Mitchell Sanders began wading again through the deep waters, their eyes, their eyes down, circling out where they had found the rucksack. First Lieutenant Jimmy Cross stood fifty meters away. He had finished writing the letter in his head, explaining things to Kiowa's father, and now he folded his arms and watched the pl his platoon crisscrossing the wide field. In a funny way, it reminded him of the municipal golf course in his hometown in New Jersey. A lost ball, he thought. Tired players searching through the rough, sweeping back and forth in long, systematic patterns. He wished he were there right now, on the sixth hole looking out across the water hazard the f that fronted the small flat green, a seven iron in his hand, calculating wind and distance, wondering if he should reach instead for an eight. A tough decision, but all you could ever lose was a ball. You did not lose a player. And you never had to wade into the hazard and spend the day searching through slime. Jimmy Cross did not want the responsibility of leading these men. He never wanted it. In his sophomore year at Mount St. Sebastian, at Mount Sebastian College, he had signed up for the Reserve Officer Training Corps without much thought. An automatic thing. Because his friends had joined, and because it was worth a few credits, and because it seemed preferable to letting the draft take him. He was unprepared. Twenty-four years old, and his heart wasn't in it. Military matters meant nothing to him. He did not care one way or the other about the war, and he had no desire to command. And even after all these months in the bush, all the days and nights, even then, 
he did not know enough to keep his men out of a shit field. What he should have done, he told himself, was follow his first impulse. In the late afternoon yesterday, when they reached the night coordinates, he should have taken one look and headed for higher ground. No excuses. At one edge of the field was a small villa, and right away a couple of old mamasons had trotted out toward him. Number ten, they'd said, evil ground. But it was a war, and he had his orders, so they'd set up perimeter and crawled under their ponchos and tried to settle in for the night. He remembered how the water kept rising, how a terrible stink began to swell up out of the earth. It was a dead fish smell, partly, but something else, too. And then late in the night Mitchell Sanders had crawled through the rain and grabbed him hard by the arm, and asked what he was doing setting up in a ship field. The village toilet, Sanders said. He remembered the look on Sanders' face. The guy stared for a moment and then wiped his mouth and whispered, Shit! And then crawled away in the dark. A stupid mistake. That's all it was, a mistake. But it had killed Kiowa. Lieutenant Jimmy Cross felt something tighten inside him. In the letter to Kiowa's father, he would apologize point-blank, just admit to the blunders. He would place the blame where it belonged. Tactically, he'd say, it was indefensible ground from the start. Low and flat, no natural cover, and so late in the night, when they took mortar fire from across the river, all they could do was snake down under the slop and lie there and wait. The field just exploded. Rain and slop and shrapnel, it all mixed together and the field seemed to boil. He would explain this to Kiowa's father. Carefully, not covering up his own guilt, he would tell how the mortar rounds made craters in the slush, spraying up great showers of filth, and how the craters then collapsed on themselves and filled up with mud, and water sucking things down, swallowing things, weapons and entrenching tools, and belts of ammunition, and how in this way his son Kiowa had been combined with the waste and the war. My own fault, he would say. Straightening up, First Lieutenant Jimmy Cross rubbed his eyes and tried to get his thoughts together. The rain fell and a cold, sad drizzle. Off toward the river he noticed a young soldier standing alone at the center of the field. The boy's sol shoulders were shaking. Maybe it was something in the posture of the soldier, or the way he seemed to be reaching for some invisible object beneath the surface, but for several moments Jimmy Cross stood very still, afraid to move, yet knowing he had to. And then he murmured to himself, My fault. And he nodded and waded out across the field toward the boy. The young soldier was trying hard not to cry. He, too, blamed himself. Bent forward at the waist, groping with hands, with both hands, he seemed to be chasing some creature just beyond his reach. Something elusive, a fish or a frog. His lips were moving. Like Jimmy Cross, the boy was explaining things to an absent judge. It wasn't to defend himself. The boy recognized his own guilt and wanted only to lay out the, fu the full causes. Waiting sideways a few steps, he leaned down and felt along the soft bottom of the field. He pictured Kaiwa's face. They'd been close buddies, the tightest, and he remembered how last night they had huddled together under their ponchos, the rain cold and steady, the water rising to their knees, but how Kaiwa had just laughed it off and said they should concentrate on better things. And so for a long while they talked about their families and hometowns. At one point, the boy remembered, he'd been showing Kaiwa a picture of his girlfriend. He remembered switching on his flashlight. A stupid thing to do. But he did it anyway. And he remembered Kaiwa leaning in for a look at the picture. Hey, she's cute, he said. And then the field exploded all around them. Like murder, the boy thought. The flashlight made it happen. Dumb and dangerous and as a result his friend Kiowa was dead. The simple, that simple, he thought. He wished there was some other way to look at it, but there wasn't. Very simple and very final. He remembered two mortar rounds hitting close by, then a third even closer, and off to his left he'd heard somebody scream. The voice was ragged and clotted up, but he knew instantly that it was Kiowa. He remembered trying to crawl toward the screaming, no sense of direction, though, and the field seemed to suck him under. Everything was black and wet, and he couldn't get his bearings. And then another round hit nearby. And for a few moments all he could do was hold his breath and duck down beneath the water. Later, when he came up again, there were no more screams. There was an arm and a wristwatch and part of a boot, and there were bubbles where Kiowa's head should have been. He remembered grabbing the boot. 
He remembered pulling hard, but now the field seemed to pull back, like a tug of war he couldn't win, and how finally he had to whisper his friend's name and let go and watch the boots slide away. Then, for a long time, there were things he could not remember. Various sounds, various smells. Later he'd found himself lying on a little rise, face up, tasting the field in his mouth, listening to the rain and explosions and bubbling sounds. He was alone. He'd lost everything. He'd lost Kiowa and his weapon and his flashlight and his girlfriend's picture. He remembered this. He remembered wondering if he could lose himself. Now, in the dull morning rain, the boy seemed frantic. He waded quickly from spot to spot, leaning down and plunging his hands into the water. He did not look up when Lieutenant Jimmy Cross approached. Right here, the boy was saying. Got to be right here. Jimmy Cross remembered the kid's face, but not the name. That happens sometimes. He tried to treat his men as individuals, but sometimes the names just escaped him. He watched the young soldier shove his hands into the water. Right here, he kept saying. His movements seemed random and jerky. Jimmy Cross waited a moment and then stepped closer. Listen, he said quietly. The guy could be anywhere. The boy glanced up. Who could? Kiowa. You can't expect. Kiowa's dead. Well, yes. The young soldier nodded. So what about Billy? Who? My girl. What about her? This picture? It's the only one I had. Right here I lost it. Jimmy Cross shook his head. It bothered him that he could not come up with the name. Slow down, he said. I don't... Billy's picture. I had it all wrapped up. I had it in plastic so it'll be okay. I can... Last night we were looking at it, me and Kiowa. I'm right here, and I know for sure it's here somewhere. Jimmy Cross smiled at the boy. You can ask her for another one, a better one. She won't send me another one. She's not even my girl anymore. She won't... Man, I gotta find it. The boy yanked his arm free. He shuffled sideways and stooped down again and dipped into the muck with both hands. His shoulders were shaking. Briefly, Lieutenant Cross wondered where the kid's weapon was and his helmet, but it seemed better not to ask. He felt some pity come on him, and for a moment the day seemed to soften. So much hurt, he thought. He watched the young soldier wading through the water, bending down, and then standing and then bending down again, as if someone might finally be savage might be salvaged from the waist. Jimmy Cross silently wished the boy luck. Then he closed his eyes and went back to working on the letter to Kiowa's father. 